Wonderful. Um, okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I apologize, we're just a few minutes behind, but um, I think after a year of doing this, most of you are probably familiar with the natural um, uh, ebbs and flows of uh, smooth technology. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus's first briefing in the 117th Congress titled Mentoring in a Pandemic, Lessons Learned and Future Implications. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing the full registration list and we're a pretty good balance of direct service mentoring organizations and youth serving organizations and congressional staff, which is exactly what we were hoping for. Um, and I'm sure everyone's coming ready to really uh, peel back uh, the layers and, and better understand uh, what mentoring programs have been dealing with for the last year, how they've adjusted, and what those implications look like moving forward. Um, as you may realize, today's event is sponsored by the Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus, uh, and we're hoping this is the first of many events and briefings uh, touching on many aspects of the youth mentoring movement, um, the challenges and successes they're facing and experiencing. So just a, a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. One, um, uh, just because of our tech issues today, you might wanna set your Zoom uh, 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 settings to see the speaker so that they're, they're enlarged for you, uh, but you can do whatever makes sense for you. We are, as you may realize, recording this presentation um, and we have turned on the closed captioning features for those of you who wanna access that. Um, please feel free to submit questions as we go along in the question and answer box. We'll try our very hardest to get to those. Um, if for some reason we don't get to your questions and or they're not answered as part of the natural conversation the panel is going to have, uh, we'll provide all of our contact information and we welcome you to reach out afterwards. All of us would be happy to answer any of those questions. Um, and as uh, along with answering those questions, we'll also be sure to provide a link to the recording, the PowerPoint presentation, and a host of resources from our panelists and from Mentor National that hopefully will support um, uh, your work moving forward. Um, as you know, this briefing is about how mentoring organizations have transitioned as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and what some of those changes might look like in the future and or for the future. Um, today, you'll hear from our, our amazing panelists, all of who are coming from uh, coming at this issue and uh, with different experiences and different lenses. And I hope you agree this will be a really rich, engaging conversation today. Um, early on in the pandemic, while all of us were adjusting to this new normal and, and the many, many complexities that came with the pandemic, schools and youth serving community based organizations were laser focused on how they could continue to provide for young people um, and in some cases for their families as well. Mentoring organizations were right up there with the rest of their, their colleagues. Um, in fact, uh, Mentor National surveyed mentoring organizations last spring and learned some interesting uh, statistics. 78% of mentoring organizations reported they chose to provide additional source, uh, resources or supports outside of the typical mentoring relationships. And some of those things were uh, providing information to food access and or food delivery, academic support, providing direct financial support to families, mental health counseling, making sure that COVID-19 uh, information was available in their native languages and much more. 75% of these services uh, um, had been done in coordination with local school districts. And all of this was being done while uh, mentoring and other youth serving organizations were dealing with the same economy the country was dealing with um, and, and the many unexpected challenges that came with it. 65% um, of programs reported um, they had to cancel planned fundraising events. Those fundraising dollars, which were intended to contribute to their annual operating budgets, um, and 30% reported um, they had previous financial commitments rescinded from sponsors and, and foundations, et cetera. Um, but mentoring organizations stepped up to this challenge and, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So to kick us off, I'm thrilled um, we're joined here today by Representative Mary Gay Scanlon, who happens to be the chair of the, the bipartisan Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus. Representative Scanlon represents Pennsylvania's fifth, con 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 excuse me, fifth congressional district she serves as the vice chair of the Committee on House Administration, and she also serves on the Judiciary and Rules Committees. Uh, before coming to Congress, she served as national pro bono counsel at a major U.S. law firm, and in that role led pro bono, uh, pro bono program that worked on issues such as <clears throat> child advocacy, immigration, housing, and voting rights. 
She also previously served as the president of her local school board. Um, and I think this just shows that there's no question Representative Scanlon it has been a champion throughout her career for young people and she's continuing in that vein in her role in Congress. So please uh, join me in welcoming Representative Scanlon. Thank you, Abby. And thank you so much for convening this group. It's, it's really exciting for me as a relatively new member. This is only my second uh, full term that I'm going into now um, to be able to speak to and work on something I actually know something about. So, um, you know, mentoring is near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm so honored to be chairing the Youth Mentoring Caucus in Congress this year. Um, joining us today are going to be a great bipartisan group of members, all of whom are passionate about the impact that mentors can make in a young person's life. Our plan is to be very active this year. We're going to host events like this one, facilitate discussions, and push legislation to close the mentoring gap for the one in three people growing up without the support of a mentor. And in our um, district, we're hoping to be able to continue to convene um, mentoring groups. We've got something teed up for a couple of weeks from now to show the varieties of mentoring that, that people can engage in. We've got community groups that do mentoring. We've got a lot. Philadelphia has dozens of sports-based youth mentoring groups. And then there's career and school-based mentoring groups. So very excited about the opportunity to work with all of them. Um, you know, this group knows positive mentoring relationships make such a difference for young people. And I'm hoping that more of our colleagues in Congress will join us as members of the Youth Mentoring Caucus so we can build even more support for this movement. If people um, want to reach out to our office, Faith Wilcox is going to be the point person in my office for the caucus and, and for our activities. So please reach out to Faith. Um, I mentioned that mentoring is, is near and dear to my heart. For 15 years before coming to Congress, I created and ran a career development and mentorship program at Constitution High School in Philadelphia for young people who were interested in civics and the law. Um, now that I'm here, I've transitioned to running a congressional youth cabinet for more than 60 civically engaged high school students in my district. Uh, in fact, we are meeting this evening. <laughs> so, um, you know, we often talk about mentoring in terms of the benefits to young people, but what surprised, I find what surprises so many um, adults about mentoring is the emotional satisfaction and the learning that they do as a result of, of participating in a mentoring program. Um, I just, you know, before the COVID-19 pandemic started, we know that about 9 million young people lacked meaningful connections with adults outside their homes in the U.S. This past year, of course, has been extremely challenging for kids and young people and really concerned about some of the statistics we're starting to see about mental health and, and the social isolation and stress, the impact that it's had on our young people. Um, you know, they're facing academic learning loss, um, mental health struggles, lack of job opportunities. It's a lot for our teens and, and young people. So, um, you know, we have seen our local organizations step up and try to work more with virtual mentoring. And there's some great opportunities. Um, our, our Congressional Youth Cabinet has a group me channel that they communicate on and they've been able to organize things in our region such as food drives, which are outside and socially distanced. Um, they give me advice on legislation when we're in the middle of votes. And um, on January 6th, they actually were feeding me information about what they were seeing going on outside as I was locked down in my, in my office. So um, there is the opportunity for connection online it has been difficult for many, many uh, young people. Um, my district in southeastern Pennsylvania includes parts of the city of Philadelphia. Um, uh, many of our, our kind of post-industrial cities along the Delaware River that are, that are pretty blighted in terms of economic and education opportunities. But then it also includes um, some very wealthy suburbs. So it's, it's an interesting district to try to address um, the needs of a lot of different people. But we saw early on that even though we don't have the rural broadband problem of not having you know, any connectivity, we have a lot of homes where people simply can't afford um, to get online. So that's been a big challenge. And that's something we're trying to address with um, bills such as the American Rescue Plan, which has just passed and has so much in it for the folks that we're trying to um, reach through mentoring programs, whether it's the child tax credit, which has the potential to cut child poverty or the money being sent to K through 12 schools, um, 
learning loss. I mean, the, the, the potential to provide some remedial um, learning opportunities over the summer and also extending connectivity, which is so important in a world, you know, we see the K-shaped curve directly in how it's impacting young people. Um, because if they can't get online to learn, if they can't get online for health needs, if they can't get online to apply for jobs or apply for you know, post-secondary education, that kind of thing, then they're going to be behind the curve permanently. So we've got a lot to do in that, in that arena. Um, and of course, food insecurity. That's a huge issue in my region. And that's why we focus so much on food drives and, and getting food out there for people. So a lot going on. But so many of these issues have been exposed for what they are and give us the opportunity to address them. So through mentoring, I hope that we can, we can really um, bring along the next generation because uh, their ideas and their energy are so needed. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with this group as, as we do that. So thank you, Mentor, for your work in getting this briefing together today. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their knowledge. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much, Rep Representative Scanlon. We are thrilled to have you chair this caucus and um, even more pleased to have you championing these issues for us um, in your position. Thank you very much. Um, so let's get right to it. I'm gonna pass the mic to our host and facilitator, uh, facilitator Dudney Silla. Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you everybody for being a part of uh, the session today. Uh, my name is Dudney Silla and I'm the program director at Mentor National. It's great to be here uh, with you today and to have this conversation about something that's so, so important for our young people. Um, I'd especially like to thank the congressional staffers that took the time out of their busy schedules to learn more about the mentoring movement and this critical juncture that providers are now facing. Um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, providers have had to significantly pivot in order to continue their quality of service. Programs have reported that some of the most common challenges are fundraising and operations due to cancellation of events and adjusting to virtual, mentor recruitment and engagement, supporting matches, connecting and communicating with mentees. Uh, young people and families are facing many significant challenges, such as lack, uh, lack of access to food, housing, um, or, and or job security. Um, there are also issues around privacy laws and program policies that do not allow for communication outside of the program and even outright suspension of programs. Youth, family, and volunteers have found barriers to continue services due to lack of access to technology, adjusting to virtual learning, financial hardship, food and housing insecurities, and feelings of anxiety, stress, isolation, and boredom. Our panelists today will help unpack these challenges further and give their perspectives on what this all means for the future of the movement. So here's how the next hour will work, hour or so will work. I'll introduce our panelists who will each have five or so minutes to talk about their work in this area. After the panelists finish presenting, I'll ask them a set of pre-selected questions. Then we'll open up questions from the audience if time allows. Again, feel free to use the Q&A feature to pose questions as they come to you throughout today's session. And so it is uh, my pleasure to introduce our experts, uh, expert panelists for today's briefing. Um, first up is Dr. Michelle Kaufman. Uh, Michelle Kaufman is a social psychologist by training and an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Behavior and Society at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her research focuses on how social factors contribute to health outcomes, particularly from vulnerable populations. She has worked all over the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and urban parts of the US to understand and eradicate health disparities. She currently serves as a principal investigator for grants from the National Institutes of Health, exploring how the intersection of digital technology and mentoring can improve health outcomes for young people in large urban settings in the US. She is a leading researcher in the effectiveness of e-mentoring and has been advising mentoring programs internationally on best practices in e-mentoring, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Currently, she is leading the research component for a grant from the Gates Foundation awarded to Mentor National to study the best practices and effectiveness of e-mentoring. Dr. Kaufman is 
also a senior member of the National Mentoring Resource Center's Research Board and a technical assistance provider for Maryland Mentor. Dr. Kaufman serves as a mentor herself. Uh, she served for a total of seven years as a big sister for two young girls through the Big Brothers Big Sisters program and has been an e-mentor for two high school students interested in health careers through the Eureka program. Thanks for being here, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, you're welcome to hop in now to begin your presentation. Thank you, Dudney, for that kind introduction. And I just want to thank uh, Mentor and the Congresswoman for, for hosting this event today and for inviting me to, to join. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, the research and evidence that we have so far on e-mentoring. Mm -hmm. Can we move to the next slide? So the, the psychological research on um, interpersonal relationships shows that uh, romantic relationships, friendships, professional connections, these can all be built entirely online. And so you know, we suspect that this, the same is true for mentoring relationships as well. We also know that digital communication has become ubiquitous. Um, especially among youth. Most youth in the US are online a majority of the day, even before the pandemic. Um, and e-mentoring really has the potential to expand the reach of mentoring, especially for youth with um, a limited number of mentors um, in their immediate community, I should say. And also digital communication can help with addressing sensitive topics with youth. And that's something uh, that my group is particularly interested in. Next slide. So I've been working on e-mentoring since about, you can go back one, please. Since about um, 2015, so prior to the pandemic. And one of the, the first things that I did along with the National Mentoring Resource Center was to do a review of e-mentoring programs um, that were currently in existence. And just briefly, some of the uh, key findings we found from that review were that um, it, it, it was unclear at that time which formats work best for which youth. Um, and we also found that e-mentoring programs tended to benefit from clear guidelines, structure, and organizational tools. Next slide. So that review actually led my team to look at um, e-mentoring for health outcomes in particular. Sorry, Caden, it seems we... Uh... There you go. Thank you. Um, so we did a systematic review of e-mentoring, looking at health outcomes in particular, um, as we were interested in how uh, e-mentoring can help youth to address health issues and uh, gain healthy practices as they move from adolescence into adulthood. And so we found that a lot of the existing e-mentoring programs, whether they were apps or digital platforms um, that were focused on health, were being used with youth with existing health conditions. So for instance, youth that had experienced organ transplants or had um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, and a lot of these health focused programs were really being using e-mentoring to um, reach youth who are challenged by in-person models, either because physically they have um, challenges that do not allow them to meet with a mentor in the community on a regular basis, or they are in need of a mentor with a shared life experience, such as an organ transplant, and so might not have a mentor readily available in the communities where they live. We also noticed that e-mentoring had not been tested with um, a health promotion context or for youth more broadly. Next slide. So these two um, reviews led to uh, mentor putting together the elements of effective practice for e-mentoring. And in this document, we share the best practices for program implementation around e-mentoring, screening, training, monitoring. And this document is nice because it highlights the work of programs that are on the ground doing the work, including um, I Could Be in Cricket Media, which are on our panel today. So that was all pre-pandemic. And in it, 
when there was some interest in e-mentoring, you know, prior to the pandemic, but it seemed that as soon as COVID-19 hit, um, uh, many mentoring programs had to be interested in e-mentoring to some extent out of necessity because of the social distancing guidelines. And our team did a study very early on in the US epidemic where we met with mentors in online focus groups to find out how they were adjusting to, to, uh, to the pandemic and making sure that they were consistently meeting with their mentees. And we found that mentors really needed resources regarding creative activities to do online. They also needed guidance on what is developmentally appropriate uh, and also privacy for youth, particularly those that are in that are in shared living spaces and might not have access to privacy. Um, next slide. So that research, and I know a lot of programs took some of those findings and, and adapted their programs accordingly, but that also led to a project we're currently working on with funding from the Gates Foundation that's been awarded to Mentor. Um, and I could be, and my research team are collaborating with them on this. Um, where we are trying to find out what mentoring programs need to be ready to take on e-mentoring. So what sort of technology um, structures, what sort of new training materials are required for them to efficiently and effectively move to e-mentoring. Um, so that's research that's ongoing. We will also be looking at iCouldBe's data from their platform to look at the effectiveness of e-mentoring on social capital and related outcomes. And that research, those results will be available later this year. Next slide. Another uh, study that we actually just started in January of this year with funding from the Bloomberg American Health Initiative is to do a pilot study of a peer e-mentoring program being run by Upstreet uh, based in the Pittsburgh area. And they do team mental health related mentoring all online. And so we will be doing a pilot study to see whether that does in fact reduce uh, depression, anxiety, increase healthy coping, et cetera, among these uh, young people. Next slide. And finally, over the last several years, my team has had funding from the National Institutes on Drug Abuse to uh, develop an app for mentors primarily to address sensitive health issues with mentees. So being in a school of public health, we're focused on, on health outcomes for youth and in particular um, drugs, sex and violence. And so we, uh, these are all topics that are very uh, difficult for adults to have conversations with youth about. Um, but we found that youth tend to open up more when it's in a digital space and they can text and have conversations about these things rather than in face-to-face -face interactions. And so this app is, is meant to facilitate those difficult conversations between mentors and youth. Next slide. And so finally, I just want to mention a couple of uh, research ideas that my team is pursuing right now. One is we need a randomized controlled trial to look at the impact of e-mentoring compared to both traditional in-person mentoring or no mentoring at all. And so I've been um, in partnership with the Institute for Educational Leadership uh, pursuing funding to, to do a large study uh, using a randomized controlled trial design. And then finally, with programs such as I Could Be and others who have established mentoring relationships that are all through text-based communication, we now have the capability using computer science techniques to look at the characteristics of those online e-mentoring relationships and determine what are, the, what are the features of those relationships that lead to successful e-mentoring. And so that's another area that we are pursuing um, in regards to funding so that we can use computer science to learn more about these e-mentoring relationships. Next slide. I just wanna acknowledge my research team and also my mentors, because um, this is certainly not something that I do alone and uh, you have my contact information. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing, you know, so much great information with us, uh, Dr. Kaufman. That was great. Um, next up, 
we have Laura Woodside. Uh, Laura is Cricket Media's SVP of Education Products. In this capacity, she oversees the development and operations of several global online collaborative learning products, including their e-mentoring product suite. Laura is passionate about educational equity with her team and with her team strives to deliver experiences that harness technology to equalize opportunities and change lives for children around the world. She is a published author and expert on e-mentoring and children's literacy development. Prior to joining Cricket Media, Ms. Woodside served as a Title I classroom teacher for over a decade, achieving national board teaching certification and a MS in reading education from the John Hopkins University. She lives with her family in Brookville, Maryland, and we're so thankful that you could join us today, Laura. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dudney, for that kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be able to be here and be able to present to you all today. Um, I think I've passed host back to you, Caden, so you can share the slides. But I just want to start by telling you um, a little bit about who Cricket Together is in our e-mentoring program, um, and then take a step back into who we were before the pandemic, how the pandemic has really changed how we have functioned, um, and, how, uh, and how we interact and how we served um, during this time. So, um, the first slide is really going to show you what our mission and vision is. So this is something that we have been doing um, since the 1990s. Our mission is really to connect, support, and sustain um, e-mentoring relationships, one-to-one uh, -one e mentoring relationships, primarily with third to fifth grade classrooms, but we've are also expanded to do six to eighth grade and really empower kids to unlock their academic and personal potential. And what we're trying to do is use e-mentorship to expand opportunities for kids to say, hey, we can overcome geographical barriers that you don't necessarily have mentors in close proximity to you. We can overcome time barriers through e-mentoring. And so this has really been our established focus um, for the past many years. And our program functions as an asynchronous mentoring program, which means that the mentor and mentee don't even need to be online at the same time, which makes it for a flexible implementation that allows us to get a wider pool of mentors and more folks who are willing to participate and really mentor the next generation. Next slide. So before the pandemic, we were really focused on school-based programming in Title I schools. That means all our schools have 50 to 100% of our students are on free or reduced meals. Um, we were focused really on third to fifth grade classrooms, and our model was we partnered with corporations, corporate sponsors, and they would provide the funding and then their employees would serve as the volunteers and we would match them one to one with students um, in our fully digital safe and secure platform that has curriculum that would kind of prompt conversation between mentor and mentee heavily academic faced but also social emotional support and these relationships would last for a full academic year. So that's how we were functioning kind of before the pandemic. We had um, over a thousand matches going smoothly inside of our platform. Next slide, Caden, then the pandemic hit. Um, and what we experienced was that 49% of our students had a fairly smooth transition. They had e-mentors. They were able to continue. They had devices and they had that connectivity at school. And so it was actually terrific for them. You see the quote on your screen because they were able to have the continued support of an adult in their corner through this transition to home learning and all of the upset. But the majority of our students, 51% of them, didn't have devices, didn't have connectivity. So not only did they disconnect from their teachers and their school setting, but these students were also all disconnected from the e-mentorship that had really become part of their support network. Um, and so it was very difficult um, when the pandemic first hit and that connectivity and those devices were not available for the majority of our students. Um, next slide. Uh, now we are a year later. So where are we with our school-based programming? 
Um, actually, we've seen great progress in terms of the hardware and connectivity, thanks to a lot of funding that has come. So we'd like to keep that coming um, to keep helping all of these schools. Um, but we've seen a lot of schools now get that connectivity, get the devices to the kids. But now they're wondering, how do we actually support kids when they have these devices in the hands and teachers are overwhelmed? So we've been able to connect a lot of children across the country with those mentors, with e-mentors to support their learning. And we've been able to give them um, it, things that are pertinent to right now. So we've heard a lot of requests for social emotional curriculum, trauma informed support for mentors, how to help them. So we've really been building out these pieces of how we help and support our matches, um, as well as COVID-19 specific information for the mentors to review with their mentees and talk about what's going on. And then on the flip side for those corporations, what we've seen is that they want to continue helping and a lot of their volunteer opportunities have gone away um, because they require a face to face component. And so we've been able to really increase our presence actually in corporate America too, with them stepping up and wanting to help during this time and serve as mentors. Um, so increased intentionality around that from our corporations. So we've seen at least uh, double our growth over the pandemic year actually and the number of children that we're able to serve now um, in schools and match them with corporate sponsors and we're in over 25 school districts doing this e mentoring um, programming. Um, but next slide, probably what we're most proud of that happened during the pandemic was actually a partnership with mentor um, and with I could be. Um, we what we were able to do is form the virtual mentoring portal. So here we were trying to meet the need that across the nation, we have all these in person face to face mentoring programs that all of a sudden were unable to get their matches together and unable to have the mentors and the mentees interact. So we were able to open up our platform in partnership um, with mentor and serve kids ages 12 and under across the country that were looking for a way to be able to still connect with their mentor. But what we found was that a lot of these organizations, although they had the heart and the desire to do this, um, they were not set up and prepared and really ready. The top three barriers we saw in terms of helping nonprofit mentoring organizations transfer online were um, the first two were just around communication. Operationally, they weren't set up to be able to communicate with those mentees and their parents um, or with the mentors to even communicate to them, hey, we have an online solution, let's get there. Um, that commun those communication channels um, were very spotty and not set up. And then overset stretched staff, these nonprofits and their budget struggles over the past year. So um, we were able to get 23 on organizations on board, some of them listed on the bottom right hand of the screen. Um, but it has been a long journey trying to help and figure out what is the best way to support um, mentoring, face-to-face -face mentoring organizations and being able to go digital and connect people online. Uh, but a positive piece of this that we've experienced with the nonprofit mentoring organizations is people have gotten really creative and then using different forms and types of mentoring. So no longer are we just school based, we've expanded into this community based um, uh, field a lot, really working on after school model. There's a lot of need for activities for kids after school now and mentoring is great and expanding to really doing some cross age mentoring, high schoolers with elementary students and also engaging senior citizens who right now are also isolated and really looking for an opportunity to volunteer. So I know I need to wrap up. So the last slide, um, just in conclusion, some of the major lessons that we've learned at Cricket Together as we've supported organizations and mentoring and corporations over the past year. One is that the value of e-mentoring has really been solidified. So this is really exciting to us. Um, I can honestly say 100% of our partners, this is more than 30 corporate partners and all these schools, nonprofits, everyone that we're working with are all interested in keeping e-mentoring as an ongoing part of their solution. Even once face-to-face -face gets back, they see the value of these additional touch points. So we're working on how do we expand support networks. We're also really looking at second, we've learned that the needs of children under age 13 are, are different now. There has been trauma due to the pandemic. And so how do we best train e-mentors to deal with this and moving forward? How do we share knowledge around this? 
Um, third is we need continued improvement and monitoring impact and speaking the same language across mentoring organizations. I know mentor plays a big role in that, um, but how do we keep getting the best tools um, and the best processes in place to do that? And finally, um, the folks on the call here, I know are all, are all a part of this, but just building that national mentoring conversation and making sure that e-mentoring is a part of that. How do we continue to share that knowledge and experience to continue to improve outcomes for kids, which is the goal for all of us. So thanks for this opportunity um, to share. And Dudney, I'll toss it back to you. All right. Thank you so, so much for sharing your expertise, Laura. Uh, appreciate it. Um, next up is Steve LaRosalier. Steve is a leading expert on brand purpose, marketing innovation, and how business can be a force for good. With a longstanding passion for mentoring foster kids, and an interest in nonprofit work, Steve was on a snowboarding trip standing on top of a mountain in Whistler, British Columbia, when he thought of his 17-year-old homeless foster care mentee who had never left the island of Manhattan, experienced the view or feeling of being on top of a mountain, no had ever put his feet on a snowboard. This thought initiated the idea for his nonprofit, Stoked. In 2005, he started Stoked with the idea of using snowboarding as a tool to pull city kids out of their daily environment and offer an opportunity to think of themselves in a broader context of the world. The organization has expanded to the purpose of empowering youth living in underserved communities through mentoring and action sports and set out on a philanthropic quest that has resulted in a presence in three cities, partnerships with 21 schools, over 10 million in cash and in-kind donations raised and opportunities shared with over 5,000 kids over the last 15 years. Stoke uses innovative programming to mentor high school youth and provide them with opportunities to gain experiences and learn skills and tools to transform their lives. Anne has been a finalist in the Nonprofit Excellence Awards for two years in a row and voted as one of the 100 most innovative businesses in New York. Welcome, Steve. I'll toss it over to you. Thanks so much, Zadni. Um, thank you to everybody for um, inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm a longstanding uh, advocate for mentoring and have been for a long time. And it's, it's great to be in community with people um, that just care about the future of kids um, using a very simple technology called mentoring. Um, so, um, the, as my introduction, in my introduction, uh, stoked, we use the lifestyle and culture of action sports like snowboarding, skateboarding, and surfing to work with kids. Um, and, uh, the way we do that is that we match them up with mentors. So like pre pandemic, we match kids up with mentors and on the weekends, they snowboarded, skateboarded, surfed, right? Um, every sport has a different set of life skills. There's really around life skills. Uh, with the sports. Um, so snowboarding teaches confidence, uh, communication skills, snowboarding teaches resilience, uh, surfing teaches empathy and understanding and compassion. And, um, and on, we also had an after school program uh, where kids learn 21st century skills like creating uh, creativity, uh, collaboration, time management, and they did that while building skateboards, right? And so we take every bit of part of action sports, extreme sports, um, and then apply it to kids. We did this in New York, LA, and Chicago. Um, and so uh, we we were snowboarding up until uh, you know March 13th of last year, um, and then we shut down and um, we uh, closed all of our school programs. And then we went virtual as best as possible. We had um, our coaches that were uh, working and mentoring the cohorts of kids um, as best as possible doing Zoom. And then we finished our after school program um, there. Um, as the school year ended, uh, one of the first calls um, that I made or uh, was to Kata, I could be, and I saw that, and I was very familiar with I could be um, through the mentoring years and 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 our relationship with mentor, and I saw that they had a a partnership with them, and so we started talking about how we could collaborate um, 
and, and work together. And so through this uh, Gates funded program, we started working together. Um, you know, I got my whole team on board and we started like pivoting towards this model, um, knowing that like with no end in sight. And I think it's looking a little like there's going to be an end. We may go back to what we did before in September that uh, that so we were like committing, we committed to this, like we committed to uh, virtual mentoring. And along with that, uh, because, you know, we, we were, were very community minded in person, like hands on activities. It's been it's been a it's a big shift, but we committed to mentoring. Um, you know, I I, I saw a lot of um, sports based youth development programs attempting to continue to serve kids the way they did. Um, but but we couldn't because of the complexity of the sports that we do. Um, and so uh, along with that commitment, we also sort of doubled down. Our after school program is really around career development, career exposure, uh, introducing kids to different mentors in the career field. field. And so the partnership with I Could Be was just an amazing sort of sort of it, it fit with us. So the, the challenges with that was that one is that we had to now go and re-educate our kids as to like what was what we were also communicating to our stakeholders and our donors. Um, that was like a it's like a new challenge. Um, recruiting less kids, kids have Zoom fatigue and um, and but this is it it's different with I could be because it's text based. And so um, you know, we saw that when when kids were on Zoom during the, our Zoom sessions, uh, they would go go on mute, no camera on. But at least with with I could be and the tech space, they can just feel free to express themselves. Um, and you know, we have we've also had to change like how we work and what we do, and which is very different. Um, um, we had, you know, our, our decreased budget was, um, was reflected in that, you know, like less staff because we're not snowboarding, skateboarding, surfing. So, um, you know, it was just a different way of working. Um, however, on the positive side, um, you know, I think I told Kate that I, like, I see, I see us always keeping a virtual program, a virtual uh, e-mentoring program, just because I think it's just an amazing uh, value add and add on. We've also been able to monetize our training for mentors. Uh, we used to train mentors for free. Now they pay to get trained. Um, and then uh, we're going to keep, oh, and then we are now able to recruit mentors from wherever, which is awesome because like now we can recruit mentors from all over the US, which is great because now people have always seen that the cities that we're in, uh, they saw that like uh, that we now have this virtual piece. So now they can, you know, share their passion for action sports and the creative industries um, and they don't have to live in our cities. And then the last piece is that now corporations have uh, really like, they see this as a very viable way um, to get their employees to be mentors uh, to our kids. So that's it. That's great. Thank you um, so very much, uh, Steve, for for sharing that and sharing your experience, you know, pivoting, you know, as a program um, in, in this time. So we appreciate you and thank you for all the amazing work uh, that you're doing. Um, and so uh, last but not least, we have Kate Schroff who will dive into I Could Be and then we'll close with a few questions and final thoughts. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Dudney. And thank you all for having us today. Um, we're, I'm so grateful that uh, you are elevating the power of mentoring uh, in this way and happy to be with you. Um, oh, and, and my apologies, real quick. Let me do the introduction as well. My apologies. We got to make sure that we do the full introduction uh, for Kate um, as well. Um, and to just highlight her experience too. Um, Kate has, you know, 30 years of experience in youth development field and has been the executive director at I Could Be since 2006. You know, under Kate's leadership, um, 25,000 young people from marginalized communities across the U.S. have been paired with virtual mentors. 
uh, mentees drive their relationships uh, with mentors and provide ongoing feedback to ensure mentee voices and agency drive the organization. Kate's focus at IQB is advancing the technology platform to provide interactive mentee mentor curricula, conduct critical research on virtual mentoring outcomes, ensure mentee safety, privacy and security, and advance innovative data science tools to measure and drive mentee impact. You know, corporate funders that share Kate's vision enable I could be to open its platform to thousands of mentees and mentors at the start of the pandemic to ensure critical relationships were sustained. Now with an eye towards the post-pandemic world, I could be as expanding, um, it's working to expand its solution um, to engage young people in rebuilding school-based relationships and developing new networks of support as its core strategy to empower students to re-engage and thrive in school. So I wanted to make sure I set that context, Kate, and thank you for diving in to share about your work. Uh, thank you, Dudley, again. Okay, so I thought it might be a little helpful if we took a little deeper dive into an actual e-mentoring program, uh, just to see some of the um, ways that we make it work. So we can go to the, the next slide here. Um, I could be was founded in 2000. We've been in the virtual mentoring space for two decades now, and we really kind of have some core principles that um, lay the foundation for our e-mentoring program. One is to ensure that the mentees are safe, that their privacy is protected at all times. Um, we believe strongly in a structured curriculum that help guide the mentor and mentee through uh, a variety of conversations um, and um, making sure that everybody is working together and working on the platform. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. Uh, we have a very intentional focus within our curriculum around building social capital. So all of the um, students that we uh, work with uh, are attending schools where 75 to 100% of the students are living at or below the poverty line. Uh, we want to make sure that the mentor and mentee are at the center of a relationship, but that the mentee is learning the skills they need to surround themselves with a web of adult support who can help them reach their uh, academic and future career goals. We can go to the next. So the way we do it at I Could Be is taking the mentor and mentee through a journey together. Uh, the first step is to create a profile and an avatar. The second step is to get them matched. So mentees can actually invite mentors who are in careers they're interested in pursuing or learning more about to work with them as their mentor really empowering the mentee to be a driver of this relationship. And then the mentor and mentee will participate in these multimedia activities where they will go through a series of themed quests as we call them, ultimately working to uh, increase mentee self-efficacy and um, help them develop career and um, future education, um, educational aspirations. We can go to the next slide. So the curriculum really becomes the space where the mentees and mentors are learning about each other, building trust, building relationships, and then focusing on six key themes uh, that uh, around academic success, graduating on time and ready for your next step, career exploration, gaining work experience while they're in high school. So these are the internships, the summer jobs, the volunteer opportunities that start opening up that world of opportunity and possibility for our mentees. We're going to then focus on uh, post-secondary and looking at all types of post-secondary educational opportunities and then getting really tactical about networking. We can go to the next slide. So the way we do these quests is to create case study formats. So the mentee is always starting. They're always relating their lived experience in each of those critical themes. Uh, so the mentor is then invited in to help. Well, so I'll start again. The mentee is um, identifying an opportunity or a challenge that they're having within that theme. The mentor is invited in to help them make the most out of that opportunity or address that challenge that that individual mentee is having. It is the mentee's lived experience that we are focused on here. 
So they will walk through this case study and um, uh, do a challenge where they're doing research to find out more about it. Then they're asking mentors questions. Um, so we wanna build that, that confidence in our mentees to ask the adults the questions they really need and want the answers to. Then the mentor and mentee brainstorm solutions for that mentee's challenge or opportunity. And then we start building the social capital. So the mentee is invited to identify two people who can help them overcome the challenge or make the most out of that opportunity. And then just the mentor will help them think through how that person can help that mentee. And then finally, the mentee um, will go out and engage with one of those two people they identified. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Through this process, the mentees are developing these case studies that they will go and live on their homepage. They can refer back to all of that work they did. And then as they identify those two people in each of those six quests, they will have a network map that builds out. So they're gonna have 12 people that they've identified and, and very clearly describe how that person can help them. Can they help me? Um, with my FAFSA form? Can they write the letter of recommendation for the internship or the summer job, right? So these, um, this network map will build out. By the end of the program, they'll have identified 12 individuals who can help them and how they can help them. And they will be actively engaging with at least six of them. We can go to the next slide. So these are the outcomes we've been seeing at I Could Be. On the left, we have an embedded, um, uh, pre and post mentee survey. So we're measuring change over time of how the mentees are doing in these three key areas. And on the right through our survey instrumentations, we can in ask the mentees how they feel about their mentors. What is that relationship like? These are fully online um, relationships uh, in this data set here. And we really believe in the power of data. And I think that's the power of e-mentoring is that we have um, the ability to collect so much data that we can then share out with the rest of the, the mentoring world about what's working, where can we do better? We can go to the next slide. Um, so as mentors and mentees interact on the online platform at I Could Be, we you know, have a 40, 50, 60 different data points that are documenting when they log in, what they do while they're there. Um, so we were able to start working with some data scientists about five years ago and could create these data science tools. So this is a, a classroom of students with the mentees on the left, their match mentors on the right. You can just advance that slide. Um, and what we do is look at a very specific set of data points that through this enormous data analysis, we were able to understand that if we focus on these four data points, weight them based on the role that they play in getting mentees uh, through the program successfully, we can not only be looking at output data, but we can analyze the data and demonstrate the impact that the, mentee, that the program is having on the mentee. And we can advance the slide again. We do the same for the mentor side so that we're really understanding um, the role that the mentor is playing in the life of that mentee. So this isn't just output data, it's impact data. We can look at this, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, we can look at this weekly, monthly, semester-based, full year-based, and really see, are we having the impact that we intend to have um, with our mentees? So we then can create these data visualization reports which are telling us how the whole cohort is doing at every given moment. So across the top, that's our cohort uh, report. Mentees, um, we can see uh, during this time period, did very, very well. Uh, mentors did very well too, but that one slice of red indicates to us that the mentee attached to that mentor has not heard from their mentor in over seven days. And that is the surefire way to have mentees disengage from programming. So then we can just click through that slice and get right, whoops, can you go back up one more, sorry. <laughs> um, and we can look at the relationship trend line. So for every single mentee mentor match, we can see every single week of the program, what the mentee scores, what the mentor scores, and all of those icons are indicating data points 
that are filling in the rest of the story about what's happening within that one relationship. So now my program staff, all of our partner program staff, our teachers in the classroom now have the information they need to go and best support that mentee and to best support the mentor. We can go to the next slide. So we, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the first thing we did was partner with Mentor and Cricket together and opened up our platforms. Um, we had over 422 organizations reach out to us. They were serving almost 80,000 uh, mentees. Um, as Laura spoke to before, we saw the same challenges, right? This access to the mentees and what systems they had in place to do that. We can go to the next slide. Um, so we had been, um, we had, talked with all 400 plus organizations. We kind of consulted with about 100 organizations, really helping them to think through how they could pivot to the online space. Um, last summer, as we, we uh, surveyed them and were consulting with them, we had about 82% of the organizations last summer thinking about how do I incorporate e-mentoring into uh, the, the upcoming school year. Um, for all the organizations that we are currently working with through this school year, 100% are going to um, bring e-mentoring in as a component of their projects. So we have uh, partnerships in San Antonio where they were meeting eight times a year. Now they're meeting every week. So for that program in San Antonio, they, they are upping the engagement exponentially from what their original programming was. This is the power of e-mentoring. Um, so I just wanted to you know, say wh whether we are finding kids on mountaintops or on surfboards or learning from home or uh, heading back to school, hopefully really soon, uh, the mentoring field is ready. Uh, we need to get our data sets to work. Um, we need the funding. We need you as our champions um, to ensure that we can reach out to this larger community and make sure that every child who needs a mentor can have one. Um, and the combination of our in-person and our online programs. Um, and thank, thank you mentor for providing all of us this safe space to collaborate and share funding and share research and share resources. Um, it, this, this can be a real game changer and I just, want to thank you all for, for your time today and um, for your commitment to mentoring. All right. Thank you so much, Kate, for that presentation. Um, one second. Thank you so much uh, for that. And thank you to you know all the panelists for sharing your your expertise, um, you know, on everything. We, you know, we had one uh, great question that popped up um, in the Q and A um, box, and I think that relates to the final question I have. And so, if everyone wants to share one thought, but thank you, uh, Daniel, for talking about you know the growth of connection among volunteers, and you know, Laura, you had a phenomenal answers in there around a lot of networking that's happening around events who are sharing their experiences as they dive deeper into this new world. Um, and I think that's a great example of the question that I have for the panelists, which is um, thinking about the future, you know, thinking about the next test. Now that we went through this whole experience, there are so many questions around what are the opportunities that have emerged from this experience? Uh, what, what changes do we see as permanent <laughs> now that we've had this experience of seeing the value of, of virtual mentoring? Um, thinking about how we fund this new work, especially if we're doing more hybrid opportunities, all while making sure that our kids both have an engaging and safe experience. And so what I want to do is just sort of allow each panelist to share your thoughts about what you see as one important thing to embrace or to think about with the future and the next steps of integrating e-mentoring into you know, our mentoring strategies and ways of connecting with kids in general. And so you can either touch on an opportunity you think about, what you think are permanent change now that we've gone through this experience, how we might fund this work. But I want to just give everyone sort of a final thought around the future of this work. Hi, um, 
Yeah, so I think one one interesting thing, I mean, is really around um, shifting shifting career opportunities for young people and using e-mentoring in order to do that. Um, I think like one of the, an interesting insight that I found is that like a lot of industries, traditional industries where they don't have a lot of uh, diversity are now looking at e-mentoring as a way to um, engage and create a further pipeline for young people in those careers. So it's less about like, you know, that particular company benefiting from having a, a volunteer opportunity. It's more about like, how can we use e-mentoring as a way to like change what the next future talent and leaders look like? And I think that's a really big uh, opportunity that I'm excited about. So great. Thank you so much, Steve. We'll go around the horn. Sure, I'll jump in. Great answer, Steve. And I would just say, I think there is so much need um, for mentorship across our country. And I think what this has opened a lot of people's eyes to is the fact that e-mentoring can be part of the solution. We need to widen the mentor pool. We need to make mentoring more accessible across our country. Um, and we really have that opportunity now. I think during the pandemic, people have realized that we can connect digitally. We can support children in this digital atmosphere. And I know Kate and I used to do a lot of work just to explain to people what e-mentoring was and that, yeah, you can really impact kids online through this type of a connection. Um, but now that that has been realized, I think we need to open the doors and we need to find ways to really get the word out so that we can get more mentors um, and get more kids really um, under the mentorship of a caring adult. And, and I would just add um, another piece because I agree with both Steve and Laura wholeheartedly um, is this concept of collaboration, right? The, this pandemic has really opened up the possibility for all types of organizations, all sizes, all shapes in every geographic location to really kind of come together, right? Silos have kind of come down and funding is being shared across organizations. Um, um, Michelle and her team, the, the researchers are right next to the program deliverers and the program creators. It, it's just kind of been this, this um, unique time and space for this type of collaboration to happen. And, and I think there is um, a great future ahead of us, um, especially with Mentor leading the way uh, in, in creating this space where that can continue. And I'll just add, at the risk of making myself a cliche, uh, researchers always want more research funds. <laughs> but I think for e-mentoring, um, this is really important. You know, we have some preliminary evidence, but if we if this is the future, um, then we need uh, funds to figure out what impact does e-mentoring really have on various types of youth. And so that's that's my hope for going forward. Thank you all so, so much for, for that. And thank you all for you know, submitting your questions and feel free to follow up with us some more um, after today's session. And so I wanna thank you know, the panelists for, for their great expertise. You know, so we'll wrap it out now. Thank you all so much for joining us, sharing uh, these perspectives. This was great. Now let's give them a quick round of applause. You know, great content. Um, you know, we're all in this together as we continue to learn you know, how to create the best systems and processes for our communities and our kids. So um, I'll now turn it over to Abby to close us out. Thank you so much, Dudney, and to each of our panelists. As uh, you know, it's a year on and we're still going over time. That is just the nature of virtual conversation and panels like this. We didn't wanna cut any of our panelists off. Um, so we didn't get to as many of the questions as we'd hoped, but I hope you all agree it was still a very engaging and very enlightening conversation. I think this is should be the start of many of these conversations because there's just so much here to unpack and to figure out how to set ourselves up for success to continue to build on what has been learned in the last year. Um, for congressional staff who are still with us, I did just want to flag for you all that starting next week in the House, a dear colleague will be circulating um, uh, in support of the single 
federal line item for youth mentoring, which is housed at the Department of Justice in the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, or OJJDP. It's funded through the CJS, line, uh, CJS subcommittee. Um, that that uh, dear colleague will be circulated next week. So please be on the lookout for it. We would love your boss's support. And if your bosses aren't yet on the bicameral, bipartisan Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus, we invite you to join. Uh, Faith Wilcox in Rep Scanlon's office is the contact. Um, I think we, yeah, I dropped her uh, email into the chat box. Um, and I do just want to take a moment to thank both Rep Scanlon for her leadership and for serving as the chair of the Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus, but also to call out her aide, Faith Wilcox, and uh, my colleague, Caden Fabi, who organized today's briefing and did a fantastic job. This is the first of many, so you'll be hearing from us soon. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us, especially our panelists. Have a great day, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend.